Welcome uh, to this week's episode of Being Human. Delighted to say I am here with Phil Driver, uh, author of the book From Woe to Flow, Validating and Implementing Strategies. Phil, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Appreciate that. So, and before we get into your work, let's talk a little bit about where you're situating. I mean, some people are, are listening right now, uh, but yeah, just describe the scene of it and where you are. So I'm in a little wooden cabin, 10 square meter cabin. This is my office. Uh, we live in the country about two hours south of Christchurch in New Zealand. Um, we moved here in uh, 2017. My wife retrained as a nurse. I got involved in permaculture. I built a new house here. And at the same time, I keep, my, keep going with this business of mine called Open Strategies. Right. You built... You- you built it yourself? Mostly. Um, so I paid a builder and he told me what to do and I followed <laughs> his instructions. Right. And it was a fantastic experience. I've always enjoyed making things and to have a very qualified and experienced person guiding me, you know, he had his own strategies, his own ways of doing things. And he said to me there was only one rule and that was I would do it his way. And that worked. And, and we've got an absolutely lovely little, little house here. Um, yeah. As well as um, a cabin in the garden where, you're, where you do your Skype calls. I've got the cabin and I've got an implement shed and a workshop and a garage and a sleep out as well. So, and a, a lot of fruit trees. So it's, we're living the life, certainly. Yeah. Uh, how many fruit trees are you telling me before the, the call? There's around 50 here at the moment and we want to put in another 50 or so. And um, we just produce food and give it away. As I said earlier, we've got about 100 pumpkins I'm trying to find a home for at the moment. All right. That's a Halloween and a half, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, and you moved out of, of Christchurch for a reason, right? And you were explaining that before we came on the, on the show. Should we talk about, a bit about that? Yes. Uh, we lived in Christchurch, both of us in comfortable jobs, corporate type jobs, and the earthquake hit. And we had some you know, pretty extraordinary experiences. I was on a hill looking out over the city. And when the earthquake hit, I, I could hardly stand up. My house, you know, rack, windows broke, bookcases fell over, the fridge fell over, tiles came through the ceiling. I thought the house was going to go down the hill. And then I looked out the window and I could see clouds of dust above the city. And I just had this sinking experience of, of obviously there was a lot of death out there. And my partner, um, wasn't my partner at the time, but she was a journalist working in the council. And so she got heavily involved in, you know, the core management of that crisis, of that chaotic situation. And we had hundreds of experiences that I would never wish on anybody, but they were profound in getting us to understand what really matters in life and to realize that the material things just did not matter the way we thought they did. And that nature and people and relationships were just overwhelmingly important. And so that led to us, you know, redirecting ourselves. Christine gave up a marketing job and um, retrained as a nurse. And I've, we've moved down here, we grow food, give it away. And I do this uh, open strategies work, you know, in parallel. Right, right. And you were telling me that, um, who was it who, who had witnessed a, a mother and a falling? Oh, so it's a friend of mine. His mum was 90 and she was in a shop. And when the earthquake hit and walked out of the shop and in front of her was a mother with a baby. And some masonry fell off the building and killed the mother. So here was this 90 year old with a dead woman in front of her and a baby. and there were other people who had similar experiences. One where a couple was trying to get out the door when they had a push chair with a baby in it, and they got stuck on the door and somebody else climbed over them and went out the door and got killed by falling masonry. And the story after story like that. And then people's reactions were so different. I was helping, working under a house after the earthquake. And there's another chap working beside me. And I said, how did you go? And he said, oh, I lost my house. And I said, what are you doing here? He said, I've got nowhere to go. I might as well help people. Right. Now, can you think what impact? I can feel emotion right now. Mm. 
the impact of those sort of statements from people. And in contrast, I met a woman in a supermarket on the western suburbs a couple of days ago, and she was complaining that the people from the eastern suburbs were shopping in her shop and they smelled. Well, the people in the eastern suburbs had no water, no electricity, no supermarkets, no doctors. And that profound difference in experience, it, it can't help but you know, have a big impact on your life and how you think about what you should be doing with it. Right. That's very moving. And, uh, yeah, and that precipitate, I mean, a huge change for your partner, it sounds like. Complete yes, yes. Yeah, and then for both of you moving out and this new life. Yep, it's, it's um, good. <laughs> so how sustainable are you, do you think, now in, on your farm? Are you, how much of your food do you grow yourself? Uh, probably 80% would be wow. we'll grow here. Um, we do eat more fruit and vegetables, but um, neighbours tend to trade stuff. So a, a neighbour traded us some lamb for some vegetables. Another neighbour has offered us some pork for some vegetables. We tend to be more vegetarian. Um, so, yeah, we're, we're getting there. I don't think, we're not aiming for 100% sustainable. We're aiming for being a lot more sustainable. So we've got solar energy. We've got a heavily insulated house. And, you know, trying to be 100% sustainable is many, many times more difficult than trying to be 90%. Right. <laughs> yeah. But, uh yeah, that sounds very, very high, high. And you must, you must uh, have an incredibly healthy diet as well. I mean, presumably it's all organic and extremely fresh. It is, all of those things, and extremely varied. So we're growing um, yeah, foods that would be less mainstream for most people, stuff you don't get in the supermarket. Um, and, yeah, it's usually pretty tasty. We've got very different varieties of apples and, and peaches, so the flavours are quite exquisite compared to supermarket food. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and what do you miss from urban life? Very little. Uh, I think when you, if, you, if you're going to go for a, suburban, uh, sorry, a, a rural lifestyle, you either go for it or you don't. You, you can't sort of do it tr and try and long for what you had in the past. We had a good time in the city. Um, this is a new life. Uh, we're enjoying it as it is. But we find that people in the country are far more communal. You know, they share. They know what each other's doing. They support each other. It can feel intrusive at times, but the goodwill is just so strong down here that, again, it's, it's the people thing that we were looking for. And you, well, it means it sounds like you have the best of both worlds because you're continue, continue, you're able to continue to run the business, open strategies, and develop your work, your intellectual pursuits, as as well as all of the uh, the lifestyle benefits that you're enjoying. Indeed, yep, yeah. And I guess this is a lifestyle that's going to open up for more and more people, right? With with added communication technology, and now with it becoming more the norm, given our you know, current crisis, I think this will become yeah much more available to people. Well, certainly, and around New Zealand, there's been massive demand for seeds. People are growing their own. Um, and all the neighbours around here are getting together and they're doing trapping of predators, you know, rats, stoats, mice, things like that. And they're starting to share seeds. So it's growing quite rapidly. And the whole concept of regenerative agriculture is taking off quite quickly down here. Uh, about time, too. <laughs> <laughs> about to, oh, okay so you, you you're sort of pretty passionate about this being something that needs to happen absolutely and you know we have to live sustainably on this planet and I, I guess my generation has been incredibly fortunate we grew up in the days where you could clear forests and it was considered to be a good thing because you were producing more food and dilution was the solution to pollution you know if you had pollution you just diluted it and sent it out to sea and we all thought those were the right things to do. Life was very easy. We had, um, you know, New Zealand could sell everything it grew to the to Britain. And so we had, you know, great standard of living. And I suppose the last 20, 30 years, we've realised that he, we and the rest of the world is overdoing it. You know, we cannot keep living like that. And it's not a case of replacing petrol cars with electric cars. It's a case of travelling less. Petrol, uh, electric cars aren't the solution at all. We've got to travel less. We've got to live local, shop local. 
Um, anyway, look, don't get me going on that one. I could talk all night. No, it's, it's fascinating. <laughs> when it does infuse your work, I mean, even that the example of the Pingo River in your book, right? I mean, you, you choose uh, questions of sustainability to focus on in, in your work. So it seems to me it, it's, it's integral to your, your worldview, it seems. Well, I think it's integral to my open strategies thinking as well, because, I mean, the whole reason we call the company open strategies is because it's modeled on open source software. So the principles of open source software are what we apply to development of our open strategy system. And that means that we're wanting to tap into the wisdom of as many people as possible and draw it together rather than top down hierarchical. And when I look at regenerative agriculture or permaculture or sustainable living, it tends to be driven by people at the grassroots level who are doing it, sharing it, um, building up communities who do it in similar ways rather than that top-down approach. And so I've found that when I'm working with you know, community groups, I might have three, four, five hundred people simultaneously trying to create a strategy. Now, to keep all of them on board, you can't just have a top-down strategy from some civil servant who thinks they know what three to 500 people want. There's no option but to make it bottom-up, or what we call bottom-up meets top-down. So I guess over the years, I've been more and more inspired by the wisdom of people in the street. Uh, you know, everyday people going about their jobs. There's a huge amount of wisdom there. and. Perhaps this sounds a bit cynical, but as I've gone up into the, the corporate ladder, I haven't found more wisdom up there. It's, it, you don't, well, I really find profoundly wiser people up there. There are some, there's no question about it. But there's a lot more people lower in the hierarchy, and if you add up all their wisdom, it's an enormous resource that we need to tap into. And that's what open strategy tries to do. Right. And so, okay. So in, in broad strokes, then how do you consolidate the views of a few hundred people into a single strategy or a set of strategies? I'll try and give you the short version here, Richard. Um, I'll say it's a three day MBA course normally. Um, I, I guess I start with a few constraints. And one is that if you're going to work with, uh, three or four hundred people, you've got to have simple common language. So if you have visions, missions, targets, outputs, frameworks, goals, themes, outcomes, benefits, and all of those words, you're just going to lose people. So we searched to try and find the simplest set of words that would encapsulate any strategy. And that's where we came up with what you referred to earlier as PRUB, projects, results, uses, and benefits. And we found that every strategy we've ever had anything to do with can be described using that sequence. Organizations run projects that produce results. People use those results and gain a benefit. And the simplicity of that is absolutely essential if you're going to deal with hundreds of people. Because humans have cognitive limits. You may be familiar with Miller's Law. And Miller's law says people can hold seven plus or minus two ideas in their head at any one time. I think that's optimistic. I think three to four ideas is a useful limit for many people. That would be about yeah. my max after uh, yeah. I've got twin boys. They're both three. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> An average night. <laughs> two things in my yes. head at once is, a, is an achievement. Well, especially if you're getting into complex stuff. And, and then if you have a diagram... You know, how many ideas can you have on a piece of paper simultaneously? And we've tested this over and over again, and I've come up with what I call driver's law. People can cope with about 15 plus or minus five ideas in a diagram. If it's their own diagram and they've created it themselves, they can handle hundreds of ideas. But if you're creating a diagram and you want other people to understand it, if you go much above 15 ideas, people just won't read it. TLDR, too long, didn't read. So these are pretty serious constraints if you're going to develop a community strategy that might be spending 20 million pounds or dollars on 150 different projects. And so how do you work with that sort of information limit with so many projects? 
And so what we find is that you could have 15 boxes of information in the sequence project result use benefit. So you might have five projects, five results, three uses and four benefits. And you would have that at a very, very high level, what we call an aspirational strategy. Sitting under that, you have a series of what we call guidance strategies that are exactly the same format. And so you might have a strategy on building a swimming pool. You might have a strategy on building a cycleway. You might have a strategy on building a library. And each one is in the same format, project result, use benefit. Project, build a swimming pool, result, you've got it, use children, swim in it, the benefit, they're healthy. And then sitting underneath those guidance level ones, we would get, we'd have another set of operational strategies or action plans, and that's getting into the fine detail. So for a swimming pool, it might be a strategy on how you build the pool, a strategy on how you employ lifeguards, a strategy on the commercial model for the, the swimming pool. But the key thing in all of this is we're using exactly the same P-R-U-B, simple language, for every topic, for every level of, of strategy. And we have found that people can understand those words better than any other set of words we've ever found. Right. It's still, so, so they're simplifying the, the language it, and I suppose the conceptual framework, it sounds like it's key. And then, yes. but then it's still, it's still for me begs the question, how do you get 300 people to agree even on 15 boxes at the top level, the aspirational strategy? Ah, good question. The answer is you don't. That might sound strange, doesn't it? Now, we're brought up to try and find a single list of priorities. And we always try and get people to agree on this single list. And that is impossible in a multi-stakeholder group. What we work on is multiple parallel sets of priorities. So the people who are going to prioritise a library are not probably going to prioritise a cycling track or prioritise free food for children. But within a community, if there are enough um, stakeholders supporting each idea, they can get on with it in parallel with the other ideas. And this is the difference between a company trying to sell a single product, uh, you know, where they just have one strategy and like, it's easy to have a single pri priority list, to a community where you have to have multiple parallels, multiple parallel strategies or multiple parallel priorities. And in my, excuse me, in my first book, Validating Strategies, I referred to three different ways of prioritizing in a community. One is the usual way where people, you know, just vote on all the ideas. And what that does is the Ideas that get to the top of the list are the least controversial ideas, not necessarily the best ideas. And that's fine. The second way of voting is we get people to cluster together on projects that really matter to them. So it's not a master list. We say, who's interested in the swimming pool? Who's interested in this? And people cluster together. And then we say, are there enough of you to get on with it? And can you get on with it without upsetting too many other people? And if the answer is yes, we'll get on with it. And the third form of prioritization is where there's not enough people supporting any one of the ideas, but maybe if you put two or three of the ideas together and edit them a bit, you might find you've got a concept that enough people will support. So working with communities, um, it's essential you don't try and have a master list of priorities because all that does is leave a whole lot of people very dissatisfied. Right, it is very reminiscent of, of open space, you know, type meeting structures. Right, it's the, it's the same way of, of um, allowing the sort of the group to self-organise into clusters and areas of shared interest. It, it is, but I think the key difference is we take it a step further and say, okay, now what is your strategy that arises right. from that conversation? Yeah, yeah. And I find, particularly in community groups, there's a lovely willingness to talk, 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 talk and share and feel good about it and say, isn't this wonderfully collaborative? Our approach is to say that is not good enough. What are you going to do about it? And that where that's where we pin it down to the project result use benefit sequence. And, and we have a particular order in which we um, develop the PRUB sequence. We almost always start with uses. So we say, what do people want to do? 
Now, most groups start with the question of what do you want? And there's a profound difference between asking people what do you want and what do you want to do? So after the Christchurch earthquakes, the council asked everybody, what do you want? And they said, we want cycleways. So they're building cycleways. The problem is if you ask people, what do you want to do? They say, I want to drive to work in my car because there's less congestion because everybody else is on the cycleway. So understanding what people want to do and why they want to do it is far more valuable than asking people, what do they want? because they have to think about themselves, they have to think internally. Whereas if I say to you, what do you want? Your reaction will be, I wonder what Phil can give me. Okay, you externalize the answer. And so you'll ask for a Learjet and a Mini Cooper and you know free booze. Whereas if I say, what do you want to do with your twins? Well, that's pretty personal. And the answers to that question are what guide open strategies. So can you see that Open strategy is driven by the users. It's driven by large numbers of people, not by the project managers who have come up with a bright idea for a project. Right. But then at the start of this, you said that it is top-down, bottom-up. So what is the top-down element? And the top-down element is usually, um, you know, we're in a democratic society or in some countries marginally democratic, where the people at the top have budget. They have money that they have taken off us as ratepayers. And so they will um, apply some constraints that this money can only be spent broadly in certain ways. And they will say, look, we've got legislation that says you can't do certain things, you can do other things. So there are always external forces coming down onto any community group. And I think that's as it should be. We elect those people to generate those rules. But they come down more as sort of values and fundamental principles and guideline rules rather than the exact detail of what we're going to do in a local community um, group. So that's where, that's the top down bit and then the bottom up bit says, well, we want to be doing these things in order to generate these benefits. Can we get those coming up to match the resources? And usually there's a whole lot of shuffling goes on. Uh, to the point where you say, well, we've got as good a match as we can. Let's get on with it. Right. Yeah, that's reminiscent of what uh, Dave Snowden, and I know you <clears throat> reference him in your book, called the enabling constraints. Yes. Uh, I mean, we, uh, up until about, until I wrote my last book, I used to use the word enabling a lot. So the results in the PRUB sequence, the results enable the uses. And I don't know if you picked up when you're reading the book, I've actually changed that to enable and motivate. Mm. So you can enable users, you can enable people to cycle on a cycleway. It doesn't mean they'll do it. So you have to understand what will enable and motivate. And we have a situation here where, um, you know, water is in high demand for irrigation and various other uses. And for irrigation, it's often... um, used for intensive dairy so we're getting pollution arising from that so the motivation and enablement for irrigation is economic you can make money out of it so farmers get on and do it the enabling and motivation for the other three well-beings social environmental and cultural those are all um, public goods so the motivation is not money So somehow we need to motivate social, environmental, and um, economic, sorry, social, environmental, and cultural well-beings. But the people who have to do the work are the farmers. So we've got farmers who are motivated to make money, and somehow we have to also motivate them to do public good. Right. So you you can see how how complex it can get when you're dealing with multi-stakeholder public sector or, or, or yeah, public uh, strategies. Right. And, and we focused here the conversation on community. I mean, do you see this as being trans, transferable to, I suppose, especially l- large corporations, which you know, have, the, have similar sizes often to, to certainly small communities, sometimes large communities? Yes, absolutely. And although we developed this system for, you know, for communities, I mean, the first work I did was with the New Zealand Muscle Industry Council and the Aquaculture Federation. 
the muscle um, industry did you say muscles I'm as in, uh, i'm schwarzenegger no, <laughs> no i'm afraid no the seafood muscles okay um so sorry i've just just lost the, the thread yeah. of your question there um, so the question was does it is it transferable to corporations and oh you yes said that's you right. first started yes, it in the muscle yeah. community so, and I, yeah yeah so we started it and that was sort of an industrial community and then it, it yeah. morphed into public sector communities and then we found that the rules that we developed in those communities actually work in a company as well. Because in a company, you've got a lot of very intelligent staff, whether they're project managers or the secretary or the receptionist who takes all the customer phone calls. They learn a lot. They know an enormous amount about the company. And we found that the wiser companies really try and tap into that distributed resource. Our byline is liberating collective wisdom. And we mean that first word liberating, not managing it. We find that with communities, with staff, if you open the door to their wisdom, the wisdom will come out. You don't have to force it out. You just have to be genuinely open and listen to it. And so you know, I've done work in large government departments, the one in Australia spending six billion Australian a year. So that was all in-house but they were a government department who subcontracted, or sorry, who had a head office, and the, the ideas went from them out to the regions and from the regions out to the districts, and the districts they employed subcontract workers. And so there was a whole hierarchy, and it was a community. I mean, it just happened to be called a government department, but it operated like any other community. And their clients, the people they were helping, were disadvantaged children. And when I said to them, your user is the disadvantaged child, what does the child do? What do they want to do? Why do they want to do these things? Now, what will your system enable and motivate them to do? And to really start with the, the idea that the children were the ones who should be at least largely defining what was needed, rather than the people in head office saying the children should do this or we think the children want that and I said well have you asked the children oh no so it's really essential to understand those end users whether they're children whether they're customers of a commercial company or just members of a community yeah yeah the other thing that struck me as I was would you pull out in the book was this question of um, accountability and, and the yes. reason I'm thinking of that is you, I'm also thinking about your characterization of sort of open space type fora. And often the criticism of that is, you know, lots of good ideas come out, but, you know, who, who's left accountable to actually take, take any action? So, yeah, talk a bit about accountability. Okay. Um, I just have to go back to think what I wrote in my book because accountability has several levels. So you can be accountable for coming up with a good idea. You can be accountable for putting it into a strategy. You can be accountable for putting it into a contract and you can be accountable for actually delivering the goods. So what do we mean by accountability? And so often we find that um, we have a purchasing agency like a government department and they try and hold a contractor accountable for absolutely everything. So to give a simple example, a government agency, a transport authority might say, we want a contractor to build a bridge. So the contractor builds the bridge. And then the government department says to the contractor, you failed because people aren't using it. And the contractor said, hang on, we built exactly what you asked us to build. The fact that you as a government department asked us to build a bridge in the wrong place, that's your problem. You're accountable for that. And I guess what PRUB does, or PRUB thinking does, is it says, who's accountable for running the project? Who's accountable for the result? Who's accountable for the use that the use will in fact happen? Who's accountable for working out what the uses are going to be? Is it the person that builds the bridge? Are they responsible to work out who's going to use it? Or is the person who's purchasing the bridge accountable for working out who the users are, what they're going to do? And I guess I argue in my book that purchasers have got to take much more responsibility for that accountability. They've tried to offload it onto project managers all over the place. So, look, and that's a, a very brief summary. I, I argue mm. it in the whole chapter in my book. Um, 
But if you, know, if you don't achieve an, an output or in our case, a result or a benefit, then you're wasting your time. Right, right. And, and then the other thing I, I quite liked was you, you made the decision between accountable for and accountable to. Oh, I said yes. that quite often, <laughs> you know, we create these, <laughs> these structures, uh, but the accountable to part just ends up becoming a, a reporting line. Yes. Uh, go on. And as, yes, well, as I said in my book, um, if you are accountable for delivering something, that's fine. Being accountable to, we don't use the word accountable to, we just use the word reporting to. And the re- reason we do that is I've so often a- come across somebody who said, oh, yes, we were accountable. We sent a report to someone. So they, they ticked the box called accountability. They hadn't actually delivered the goods, but they had satisfied the accountable to statement. They had not satisfied the accountable for statement. So we just don't think that the words accountable and to should go together. You report to and you're accountable for. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I like that, yeah. yeah. It makes a lot of people very uncomfortable. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other question, and this is maybe a broader question, is if we, <clears throat> if we take a definition of complexity, which is we cannot know causes and effects up front, right? Yes. If, if it's complex, we can't know what, will precipitate from taking this particular action. So that if, if we take that as true, but then we say that prob is, is to be applied in complexity, but you're also uh, asking people to take a evidence-based approach. How, how do you reconcile that? Okay. I think it's crucial to distinguish between a complex environment and the simplicity of action. So it doesn't matter whether you're in a simple environment, a complicated, complex or chaotic environment, your action always has to be simple. So if you think of simple as known knowns, complicated as unknown knowns, complex as unknown, unknown, and chaotic as as unknowable, you might be in a complex environment where I don't know and you don't know what the right answer is. But that doesn't mean we're going to do nothing. We have to do something. So as Dave Snowden says in that, that fabulous paper of his with, with um, Mary Boone and, and the HBR, um, in a complex environment, you have to take a key action. And, and his recommendation is that you probe the system. So you've got a complex situation. You essentially set up experiments. Let's try this and observe really, really closely what happened. And if it worked, we learn something and we might do that again. We might do it slightly differently. But the thing we do is still simple. You can only do a known known. You only can do what you know what you're going to do, even if you're in a complex environment. And, and the key thing with a complex environment is you probe the system, you, you test things, and you look for solutions emerging from that environment. So they have to emerge. You can't generally create solutions in a complex environment. And that is very, very difficult for many people to get their head around. And just as an example, back to the Christchurch earthquakes. After the earthquakes, we had a whole lot of people move into Christchurch and they tried to be heroes. They tried to save us. They tried to bring in best practice. They tried to be experts. And best practice is great in a simple environment and experts are great in a complicated environment. But in a complex environment, there were no experts. Nobody in the world had ever experienced what our city went through. It was absolutely unique. So to think that you can bring in an expert who's a town planner from somewhere overseas and that they're going to understand the implications of 3,000 kilometres of underground services destroyed and you know, limited budgets and so on, is just, it's just crazy. So what we really needed in that environment was people who could understand complexity, probe the system, try something. This worked, this didn't work, this worked. Let's do the things that work. Let's draw on as many ideas as we can. Because one of the things we find in a complex environment, especially after a crisis like an earthquake, is that people get on and do things in their own local areas. 
and they solve all sorts of local problems. And one of our challenges is we don't really tap into that well enough. We don't bring it to the surface. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm working on at the moment with open strategies. If we have a crisis like an earthquake and a community group comes up with a really good idea and it works, can we capture that idea in a sub-strategy and put it online? So that anywhere anybody anywhere in the world can pick that up when they have a crisis and say, well, that will more or less apply to us. We'll just change it a little bit for local conditions. And so I'm, I'm sort of pushing this idea of an international library of sub-strategies, libraries of things that work in the same open strategy format. So I just throw that out there as um, something I think about when I'm working in the garden. Yeah, no, and I, and I do... I like that idea and it's it's pretty novel right the idea of a kind of catalog of of strategies is not something i've i've heard of before at all or sub strategies as you say but I'm, I'm still left somewhat with this question of if we accept that, that whatever solution we create will be emergent and therefore the the results will be emergent and potentially how people use the result is is going to be emergent and what benefits they they gain so if that's yeah. true how, what's then the validity in upfront trying to define our project, our result, our use, our benefit. So this is where, uh, as I said, I come back to the uses. So in Canterbury after the earthquake, if we went out to the members of the public and said, what do you want to do most of all? And if we had built our um, recovery around their answers, we would have had a much better recovery. So what instead has tended to happen is the business leaders have come along and said, we want to get our businesses up and running again. Does that sound familiar in the era of COVID? Yeah. And so money gets poured into those to reinvent or, or to return to the old normal. Whereas after the earthquake or after COVID, you ask a whole lot of people, what do you want to do now in this new world? What resources do you need now? And that should guide your projects and results. And in my experience, that's true. For example, my son, um, he's got a couple of um, young girls, probably a bit like your twins, highly energetic. He's a psychotherapist, so he heads off to work every day. And um, he couldn't wait to put his children into daycare every day. And now that they've had seven weeks of lockdown, he doesn't want to put them into daycare. He just loves being with his kids. And so the experience of, of the COVID has totally changed his way of thinking. And I believe that governments worldwide need to tap into that changed way of thinking. You know, so many of us are now caring far more about our nurses, about our supermarket workers and, and so on. We really, really need to listen to that. And, and tourism in New Zealand would be a classic. It's our, one of our two largest industries but we've got no tourists coming into the country, full stop, likely to be like that for a year or so. And the tourism industry is saying, you need to bail us out. And there's quite a lot of people saying, well, tourism had got a bit overcrowded and maybe that's not the sustainable future. With climate change, flying people from all over the world and aircraft to come to New Zealand, is that sustainable? So there are pretty serious debates going on in this new complexity as distinct from the old complexity so i don't know if that really addresses your question yeah no i i i i do see something in what you said there the, this idea of of sensing for what is you know what, what is now what's emerging now uh and starting really you well you well this is actually you say this don't you that, that you you implement from left to right projects results uses benefits but you strategize from right to left so you're yes. so you're starting by asking people, you know, what do you need now? What what would you benefit from right now, given what is? I, I, I would use slightly different language. Rather than what would you benefit from, I would say, what will you do, and what benefits will you create by doing that? If right. you start saying what would you benefit from, it sounds like you're talking about a result. Ah, okay. Okay, so yeah. they're not benefiting from the result. The result is just a library. It's a white elephant. They're using the result to create the benefit. So, sorry, I'm picking you up. No, on no, it's, there, it's, but, it's, it's, it's but, important. You, yeah. you do pick me up on it. But so, okay. No, okay. No, I see so, the distinction uh, there. Yeah. The pedantry of our language. I mean, some people have said I'm the guardian of the paradigm. 
So I'm the guardian of the paradigm of PRUB. And if anybody steps out of, out of line, I, I, I slap them back into place pretty fast. Because yeah. I find as soon as you start being loose with that PRUB or B, BURP, things fall apart. <laughs> and interestingly, when we first developed PRUB... If you're going to burp, burp, burp appropriately. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, see... This was really interesting because we always used to think you had to burp when you're doing the strategy, and that is wrong, actually, because we found that the benefits from almost all strategies are very, very similar. Happy, healthy, and wise. Okay, that's the benefit. The uniqueness is in the uses. So while I sort of use burp, most of the time I actually use U-B-R-P. Understand okay. the uses. What do people yep. want to do? Because I'll tell you, I want to go skiing. Okay, that's a use. Why do you want to go skiing? Oh, it gives me a, an adrenaline rush. Well, there's the benefit. So that means they need a ski field that gives them an adrenaline rush, not a gentle slope. Okay, so you can see how the use and the benefit guide the result. So we start with uses now, not benefits. Uh -huh. Took us about 10 years to realize that. Right, and asking people what would you like to do gives you the use because they because to it do does. something they've got to use something, right? They've got to, yep. yeah. And and people just struggle to answer that question about uses and benefits. Everybody wants to talk about projects and results. I say, oh, we need a new library. We need a new one of these. We need one of those. We need somebody should put more money into X, Y, Z. And if I'm running a workshop, I write all those ideas up on the wall and I put them up under projects and results because I have a sticky wall and I put these ideas up. But then I say, so tell me how people are going to use these things and where's your evidence for that? And there's usually a deep and profound silence. And I said, well, have you actually asked the people who are going to use it? I did some work in a very large city in the United Kingdom, and I won't say who, for one of their borough councils and they were just about to open a leisure centre, 30 million pounds worth. And I, that was great. They wanted to just clarify they'd got the strategy right. And I said to them, well, who's going to use it? And I said, school children are going to use it. And I said, oh, that's really great. Have you asked the school teachers? And there was a stunned silence. And I said, well, when are the kids going to use the swimming pool? And they said, oh, well, during the day. And I said, so you haven't asked the teachers? No. So I said, well, how are the kids going to get here? And they said, oh, they're going to come by bus. And I said, where are the buses going to park? And there was no bus parking. Now, that was just before, about two weeks before they opened this huge leisure centre. Now, if they had asked the question about uses, they would have got that right. They would have asked, who's going to use it? School children. Oh, we better understand that. How are they going to get their buses? Well, we better have a bus park. So can you see that there's a wealth of information and uses that is not in, uh, in the results? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that, that, um, you know, that, makes, a lot, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and it also it reminds me of the Instagram story, right? I, I don't know if you've heard the Instagram story where Instagram, the, the guys who started Instagram um, were not coders. Um, okay. So they didn't have a program, they didn't have any money, and they didn't have anyone to pay to program it, uh, you know, an app. So they started. I can relate off to a, that. Yeah. yeah, right. So they started off with a, a meetup for photography lovers, and uh, that was how that's how that's how Instagram started. And then, uh, and then they started with wireframes, like pencil pictures of what the app might look like. So yes. they they started. You know, how would you use an app like this, right? And, uh, and yes. grew from there. Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, I we do have a software tool. I don't tend to use it because the the most powerful experiences we find with PRUB thinking is in workshops with the key stakeholders and just shifting their thinking into the use benefit space. And all these aha moments go off and then there's a whole lot of uncomfortable feeling because they realize they don't actually understand the uses and benefit. So it's very, very sobering and also very, very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, another guest on the show actually um, talks about right to right to left thinking yeah yeah which uh, i suppose follows the same path start with the end in mind yes yep yeah um but Mike but again his name. yeah, yeah. I, I guess what we've tried to do is systemize that and um jonathan norman who was the publisher of my first book 
um, his comment was that I brought an engineering discipline to the idea of strategies and communities. And that I was always taught as an engineer that um, you haven't achieved anything until it works. And so I've always been focused on the endpoint functionality. Does my system work? And so with, with open strategies, I think I've now got every nut and bolt tied down. I'm sure there'll be new ideas keep popping up, but there's an enormous amount of fine detail into exactly how you'd use prub thinking. Um, I'm going off on an advertising spiel yeah. at the moment, so I'll back off. Yeah, no, no, no it, it, it makes it makes a lot of sense. And you're sort of breaking the, the stereotype of the engineer who's just interested in the kit. And, uh, and yeah. Well, I guess I was a mixture of a researcher and an engineer. So um, I love doing research. I thrive in complexity. I love uncertainty. And my mum often used to recount a story when, as a child, I used to play with Meccano. And I don't know how many of the listeners remember what Meccano was. but I had Meccano. F- you had Meccano. It was a fabulous yeah. stuff with nuts and bolts and whatever. And mum said to me that if I was building a Meccano car, I never put the last wheel on because I didn't need to. I knew it was going to work. When I had three out of four wheels on, I'd move on to the next idea. And so creating ideas where I can get it to the point where I know it's going to work is, is what spins my wheels. And I guess with, with open strategies and prub, um, we've tested it over and over again, and we've, we've tripped up on little things, and we've sort of gone back and said, now, why didn't that bit work? And we've gone back to the users and say, what, what were you experiencing when you reacted like that? And I had the privilege of um, four years in living in London and Oxford. I think it was 2004 to 2008. And I met up with some fabulous people, um, a little company called Dialogue by Design, um, Office of Public Management, um, even the Cabinet Office, British Telecom. And I met some fabulous people who challenged our system, challenged our way of thinking. And although I've written the books, I've absolutely built on the input from, I'd say, several hundred really, really good thinkers. And each one, like like one guy just came up with the word liberating for liberating collective wisdom. And that was one of those aha moments um, that took us from being manage collective wisdom or control collective wisdom to liberate and when you think philosophically liberate rather than control it changes everything you do you can't make anybody do anything you've got to enable and motivate so if you're going to do that you better understand what is going to enable and motivate the people that need to be enabled and motivated and that really requires you to listen and i'd have to admit that as a tall white male engineer that didn't always come easily (laughs) right yeah i I remember one classic story where my son worked for me over in england and we would run these strategy workshops and at the end of the workshop i'd say to him well how did it go and he would say oh dad the same as last time and what he meant by that was dad you answered the question that you wished they had asked you didn't answer the question that they actually asked. And that was really profound because very often I had in my mind what I wanted to tell them rather than genuinely listening to the question. And it's, it's been really hard to, to listen properly. And I think that's a key element of open strategies is we've got to listen to what those uses and benefits are, not what we think they should be, but what the user themselves believes the use and benefit is it's quite challenging oh yeah that's yeah that's extremely challenging for, for most of us certainly me <laughs> yeah learning to listen it's a lifetime's work isn't it it is i'm still working on it my daughter my son and daughter help me i say my son's a trained psychotherapist and my daughter is a fully qualified lawyer and a teacher um so yeah i get it from both directions very it's very healthy <laughs> Good. Okay, so you've got you've got the the project to open up, open these this this catalogue of strategies, sub strategies. Yeah, anywhere else you're taking the the work right now? Um, no, that's that's the main one that I suppose is is the next big step. It was an enormous relief to get my last book published. Um, I don't know if you've ever written a book, but 
oh no i'm um, not and i'm uh, just, you yeah. know one book is an achievement the fact you've done two is something else well i i'm always i always like the quote from blaise pascal back in the 1600s where he wrote somebody a letter and he said i'm sorry i wrote you a long letter i didn't have time to write a short one and to write a book and make it succinct and not repeat stuff and and i know i've got too much repetition still in my book it's really really hard work and i'd have to thank jonathan norman who was my um original publisher he, he was incredibly helpful he's now at the major projects association so he was a fabulous editor and i learned an enormous amount from him so yeah this is the year where i'm sort of recovering from having written the book and um really thinking around how do i get this library off the ground because i think post covid is actually a potentially a very exciting time for getting such a library off the ground because the majority of strategic actions that are being taken at the moment are not being taken by government. They're being taken by people in their own homes or small community groups or people who are supporting little old Mrs. Jones down the road who can't walk. And I believe we need to capture those wise actions in the form of a library of strategies. And if you can think of a sponsor, let me know. <laughs> Right. One of the when I do my lectures in Germany, so I was lecturing in Germany last night, and it was to the Masters of Library and Information Systems. So I work with a professor over there, and I'm hoping to get one of their students to do a um, a master's thesis on the design of such a library. Right. Because there's a lot would go into it. I mean, how do you know that a sub strategy is credible? What do we do if somebody comes along with a strategy that we disagree with, like act like maybe anti-vaccination? So this pretty serious thought would have to go into a library of that nature. Um, and that then comes down to understanding the users of such a library. How would people use it? What would the benefits be? So I have to, as a friend of mine says, you've got to eat your own dog food. You know, I've got to apply prub to my own business and I'm working on it. Great. Good. All right. Well, uh, yeah, let's stay tuned for that. And anybody out there who wants to uh, get involved in that project, it sounds like a, a worthy cause. Um, and we'll put, we'll put links to the books uh, yeah, in the description for the show. Uh, anywhere else you would send people who want to take a deeper dive into this thinking? I, I think the books is, is the best. If you happen to be based in Cologne, then perhaps attend one of the courses I run. Um, Pre-COVID, I was running my three-day course. So the, the university in Cologne certifies my course so I can run it anywhere in the world and people get a certificate from the uh, University of Science, Technology and the Arts in Cologne. Um, so I'm hoping to fire those courses up again. But look, I think start with the books and then I'm always happy for people to Skype, you know, give me a call, talk about it. Um, although... I want my business to be a commercial success. I'm far more motivated by getting people to use it and people coming back and saying, wow, this worked, you know, it worked for me. And I think, great, you know, you, you go for it and I'll go and grow pumpkins. Because well, honestly, it's, it's quite inspiring when you see people have changed the way they were doing things and they've got better outcomes. It's very, very rewarding. Yeah, you know? no, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Fabulous. Okay. And, and I hope the, the, uh, the new fruit tree program, growing program, uh, works out. I'm sure it will. Yes. In fact, I have, well, Thanks. I have friends. We've got close family friends in Christchurch. Oh, have you? So you end up with I a will... surplus. Maybe I, I'll, I'll find a home for them. Oh, I'll put, put them in touch. I mean, we're always happy to have visitors and uh, people come and see what we're doing because it's, it's the sort of thing that grows because people see someone else doing it and they say, oh, I could do that. And then it just, it, it spreads. And the community of people involved in permaculture is just fantastic. There was a woman put a post on the New Zealand permaculture site a couple of nights ago. And she had bought a block of land five years ago, moved onto it with a house bus and she had 20 cents to her name. And she was describing what she's managed to achieve since then. And she had 800 posts commenting on her post. And just people sharing, enjoying her inspiration and sharing it amongst each other. So when you're part of a community like that, uh, yeah, life's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. 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 Looks like it. Good. All right. Well, thank you once again, Phil. Fabulous conversation. 
really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope our listeners do too. Oh, well, I appreciated the opportunity, Richard. So all the best. And if you're coming and to it's, New it's, Zealand... It's evening, right, for you now? It is. It's uh, yeah. two minutes to eight. So, yeah, um, yeah so if you're coming to New Zealand, let me know. Um, okay. Once, once we open our borders and let these foreigners in again. <laughs> <laughs> these okay. virus-ridden foreigners. Okay. That's right. Yeah, well, in the meantime, okay. enjoy your twins and, um, yeah maybe in touch again cheers all right yeah thanks phil cheers bye-bye